Hey, welcome to Keep On Pushing TV. I am your host, Devon Harris, and you know, what we do is that we share ideas and insights that are going to help you live your absolute best life. And so if that's something that you're even remotely interested in, guess what? You are in the right place, man. So welcome to Keep On Pushing. Why would anyone, you know, in his right mind, jump on a sled, stick his feet out, and go down an icy chute in excess of 80 miles an hour? Well, maybe our guest today can tell you exactly why. You know, he, in fact, started uh, luge at the age of 21, picked up the sport, and started training for the Olympics, and now today is a four-time Olympian. In fact, he is the first person, I think the only person, to have ever competed in four Olympic Games in each in, in a different decade. He, is, uh, he has done mountain climbing, and today he's a best-selling author, and he's a motivational speaker. I am so pleased to welcome to Keep On Pushing, Ruben Lujman Gonzalez. Welcome, Ruben. Thanks for coming on. How are you doing, Devin? It's great uh, to see you. Yeah, man, it's great to have you on. You know, of course, look, you know, we both competed in two Olympics together, 88 and 92, but we didn't meet until, you know, much later. Um, but you know, as well as I do, that there's this rivalry between bobsledders and losers. You know? We're going, why would anyone go at 80 miles an hour and stick their feet out in front of them? They must be losers. Um, <laughs> And uh, so we call you guys losers, but I know you have a, a, an interesting story of a, a champion boxer who thought when you were telling him what you were doing, what you did, you thought you said you're a loser. Now, tell us about that. Yeah, you know, uh, this is even before my first Olympics. I was, I was working out in my gym in Houston, and it's just a little bitty gym. And in walks Lou Duva, who was, uh, he's a very famous boxing manager. He managed Evander Holyfield and, and a bunch of, champions so he walks in with about 10 boxers and Evander's one of them and this is right after he'd won the the heavyweight title you know and Evander was a, a middleweight you know a, a light heavyweight actually and he moved up everybody thought he was gonna they were gonna kill him and he made it so all of a sudden he's famous and when he walked into that gym everybody including myself started doing the same thing we started whispering real loud that's Evander Holyfield what's he doing here and nobody had the guts to go up to him and me neither, right? But the littlest one, I mean, he must have been five foot tall. Uh, he didn't look so intimidating. So this little guy, he gets on a stationary bike, and I got next to him, and I asked him, you know, what do you do? He says, I box. What do you do? And I said, I, I'm a loser. And he said, don't you ever call yourself a loser, man. You're a winner. And he said it like that so loud. <laughs> Everybody got off their machines, and they started looking at me. Yeah. And I, I came this close to just walking out that door and joining a different club. Yeah, that, and I agree with him, man. Don't ever call yourself a loser, man. You're, you may be a loser, but you're not a loser. There you go. <laughs> you're cool. But look, I, I might be biased here, but I think more people know about bobsledding than they know about luge. So you know, tell us about your sport, Ruben. What is it like to you know, head down essentially a bobsled track with your feet sticking out in front of you. <laughs> well, you know, actually, I, now they're starting to know a little bit more, but, but I still tell, you know, a lot of people, hey, you guys ever seen Cool Runnings? He goes, yeah, okay. Well, we go down that same track, but we're laying down on a little bitty sled, right? Yes. <laughs> so I have to explain it using you guys. Yeah. But, um, it's, um, it's very counterintuitive. Uh, I've had a, one of the doctors up at the... Uh, uh, at the end of the Albertville Olympics, the, the doctor that was in charge of U.S., uh, uh, actually it must have been, no, it must have been the Salt Lake City, but he said he, he was over bobsled, skeleton, and luge, and he said 70% of the injuries came from luge. And uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, it's very counterintuitive. Anything that would be normal to do will get you into trouble. And so there's a lot of injuries. And um, with the skeleton, I don't know if you ever did the skeleton, which is like head first luge. I, I, I like company. I'm going to stick to bobsledding. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you like company. <laughs> well, the, the skeleton, if you look to the, you know, you just look into the curve and that drives your shoulder down and it drives. So you just do Stevie Wonder the whole way down and you're okay, right? 
doesn't mean you're going to be fast, but at least yeah. you get down. And uh, my, my, my daughter, when she was 16, I took her to Salt Lake City for a skeleton camp. And, and they started them off on curve 12. Uh, and um, by the end of the week, they were going from Lady Star. They were yeah. going over 60 yeah. miles an hour from Lady Star. And it would take us, uh, you know, five months at least to get the Lady Star for brand new, new luge beginner. Yeah, so I'm really jealous. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So, look, I, I know you were born in uh, Argentina, you know, so, so really you're supposed to be like the next Diego Maradona or the precursor to Lionel Messi, you know, both who are small guys, kind of like yourself. But instead, you end up, you know, competing in luge. You know, you describe yourself as a guy who was not a great athlete, but yet you're a four-time Olympian. How does that happen? You know, if I had stayed in Argentina, I, they're soccer maniacs over there. I still love soccer. still my favorite sport yeah. to play and to watch. Uh, but I'm slow, right? What? What position did you play, by the way, in soccer? Uh, mostly, they put me in. They they put me fullback, right fullback, because uh, you know that's a I could, or sweeper. You know, I could yeah, not, do not too much running, huh? <laughs> no, that's right. Wait for them, right? And they call me the animal because I just you know I was uh, I was mean. But <laughs> anyways, I'm slow, right? So uh, you know, if you're not if you don't have a quick you know a speed in most sports, you're you're dead. And even though I have good good skills, I was still on the bench. We moved to the States when I was a little kid and I caught the Olympic dream. And um, it was a pipe dream all my life. And then when I was 21, I'm watching the Sarajevo games, the 80, 84 games on TV. And I saw Scott Hamilton, the, the figure skater, uh, win the gold medal. And he's tiny. He's about 100 pounds, you know, five foot one. He yeah. gave me hope. I thought, if that little guy can do it, if he can win, I can at least play. <laughs> so I went to the library and uh, looked at the list of the sports and it took me five minutes to, you know, after looking at the, at the summer sports, you have to be a super athlete. Forget this. Mm -hmm. Then I started looking at the winter and my nickname in high school was Bulldog because I was always very tenacious, very perseverant. Yeah. So I thought, hmm, I have to find a sport with a lot of broken bones, maybe be a lot of quitters. And then I just won't quit. I'll make it to the top on the attrition rate. Gotcha. So what I tell people is fine. You know, you have to figure out what you're good at. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And then you go with your strengths. Mm -hmm. And so I picked the luge because it looked, I've never seen it on TV. If I had, I probably would never have picked it, right? <laughs> I had a little picture of a guy on a luge. And I thought that looks pretty tough. That's the one for me. Yeah. And I called Lake Placid. And at first the guy wouldn't let me in. He said, you're crazy, man. If you're 21, you should have 10 years experience. There's no way. Yeah. And I, would, I knew if I hang up, it's all over. So hanging up's not an option. And I just kept him on the phone. And I happened to tell him that I was born in Argentina. And he got all excited. He said, if you go for Argentina, we'll train you. And I said, why? <laughs> a minute ago, you weren't going to train me at all. Right. This is the sport of luge is in danger of getting kicked out of the Olympics because we're not global enough. We don't have enough countries. We're recruiting. I said, wow, that sounds good. Tell me more. Yeah. He said, well, if you'll go for Argentina, you'll train with us, you'll travel with us. We'll have to compact 10 years of training into two years. You're going to get hurt a lot, okay? Because <laughs> uh, so the last week. Right up your alley, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I thought, wow, this works right into my plan. This is sounding good. <laughs> and, uh, but he said, the last two years, you have to be competing against the best in the world because you have to qualify. You know, back then, the top 50 men made it. Mm hmm. And so will you go for, you know, will you go for Argentina? And I told the man, I'll go for anybody. I'll go for Pakistan. I don't care. I don't even care what sport. I just want to be an Olympian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I went, and it was brutal. And, but four years and a few broken bones later, I, I, I made it. Wow. That's, that, it's really interesting, you know, because, you know, when people meet me, you know, even today they laugh at the idea that a Jamaican can be bobsledding, right? And our story is so similar, it's not funny, because we did not know much about bobsledding in the beginning, and it kind of fell in our laps, and in, in no time we were at the Olympic Games, right? But you had a few more years to train than we did. But you're from Argentina, you, you're living in Houston, which is as, I mean, I went to Houston a few years ago in the summer, and I began to question my Jamaicanness. It was so hot. Yes, <laughs> and here, here it is, you're from, from 
you know, steamy Houston discovering the sport out of nowhere and here you have the Olympic Games. It just, I think, uh, reinforces in my mind in a way that we are all so much more alike than one would believe, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when, I, when people laugh at, you know, they say, well, how can Jamaicans be boss letters? You know, I tell them, or how can somebody from Houston be a loser, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I tell them, hey, the tracks will never come to me, right? I have to go to the track. You have to go pursue your dream. You can't wait for it to lo fall on your lap. Otherwise, you're going to be 80 years old and you'll have all these regrets of you didn't do anything in life. I agree. Yeah. And I, and I, and I, you know, I've heard you saying uh, that if your dream is big enough, the facts don't count. You know, I, I, I and, and my saying to that is never mind the facts, because when you focus on the goals with a positive attitude, you get to create a brand new set of facts that Amen. are far yeah. more powerful, far more dynamic, far more amazing. And I think our story kind of demonstrate that. Yeah. Yeah, I met a guy, well, actually not personally, but I've met him over the phone. His name is, and I know you know him, uh, Greg's son. Mm, and, I know, Trini. <laughs> yeah, Trini that, right? Well, yeah. this guy has a great story. He worked, he, he went to school or he taught in Boise, and then yes. he began uh, helping out uh, the, the younger uh, Jamaican bobsledders, and he got inspired, and he started training. And the first time he went to Calgary, he thought he was going to die from the cold. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. but but he got into it and, and now i think he's been to a couple of olympics in yes. the boxing world. so he That's actually went, love when you guys uh, no i was about to say trini greg's son went to college with chris stokes who was on our team stokes yeah uh, your driver right back, uh, well he was uh dudley's uh brother yeah oh, okay dudley's brother yeah, okay yeah so that yeah, man, so I, I know I know I know Greg really well. But you know, so you spoke about in uh, in high school. Uh, uh, well, on the soccer team, they call you uh, the maniac. Is that was that? Yeah, what they call me animal, animal, animal. animal. <laughs> yeah, and in high school, they call you the bulldog. So yeah. where did that tenacity comes from, Ruben? Is that was that from your bringing, or was that just something that was innately in, in, in you? You know. I was talking to um, Jack Canfield, the guy that, that wrote The Success Principles, right. and, uh, and he teaches a lot about self-esteem. And he was interviewing me for his book a few years ago. And it's funny, I called his office right after I wrote my first book. I was just trying to get some testimonials from famous people, right? Because yeah. uh, you put some big names in your book, you know, they might buy it. Yeah. And so I called Jack's office, and his secretary said, he's right here. And he got on the phone and he said, you got five minutes. Well, we talked for an hour and a half. We became friends. <laughs> and, and it was during the time that he was writing the success principles. He says, man, I want to have you restored in, your, in my book. And he put me in three times, you know, and I've gotten lots of bookings from that, from people that read his book. But he is a big believer in self-esteem. And he said, Ruben, you must have an incredible self-esteem to do this, which you did. And I told him, no, you know, Jack, I think it's the opposite for me. I always got picked a lot in, in, in school when I was a little kid. When I moved to the United States, I, I didn't fit in, right? I didn't know the customs. I didn't speak the language. And I got picked on. And I thought there was something wrong with me back then. And I think it was that me trying to prove to myself that I was worthy, right? And um, so that was part of the driving force. And my mom, she used to always say, you know, we... Uh, we are a family of dreamers, okay? Your great-grandparents, when things were really bad in Italy at the turn of the century, they left everything behind to go to Argentina. Yeah. And, then you're, and then we left everything behind to come to the United States. We are dreamers. We're willing to give up something good for the hope of something better in the future. And so that kind of you know, percolated in my head, and it's just a combination. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So you, you, you mentioned that you, you came here when you were young, I think at six. And, uh, you know, and of course, the world is very different today to include here in the U.S. Um, you know, there are many segments of the population here that that is not so immigrant friendly. You know, they're not so friendly to Spanish speakers in general, Mexicans in particular. Um, what was it like for you as a, as a six year old moving? You mentioned that you got picked on a lot. What what other dynamics existed uh, then? 
Well, you know, when we came from Argentina, the idea was always to go back, right? Uh, there was a lot of terrorism and people disappearing and the economy was a mess. And so, hey, we're just going to come to the States for a few years and we're going to go back. But it never got better. So they kept pushing the return date. So in my mind, uh, our house was a little a little bit of Argentina. And we I, I never really assimilated too much because the, you know, and then finally, it wasn't until, you know, almost till the end of high school that we realized, no, we're staying. <laughs> it's never going to get better over there. And so, um, so I didn't uh, uh, assimilate as quickly. My, my little brother, he was two years old when we came, and he, he became American more uh, easily, right? He didn't have to go through what I did. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but it was tough. But then, you know, it, it's kind of on the – I always try to look at the good side. It made me tougher, right? <laughs> so. Absolutely. So uh, I'll take it. I wouldn't change it. <laughs> right. So you played <laughs> soccer growing up. You eventually did lose, but were there any other sports that you did? I played ping pong pretty good, you know, and <laughs> well, we have the table downstairs. And um, uh, I guess but, you don't have to run around too fast. Yeah, for that, oh, right? that's not very far, you know. I can handle <laughs> that. That fits, fits a slowpoke like me, you know. <laughs> but any sport I like, you know, uh, squash is a lot of fun and racquetball. Yeah. But uh, I'm very competitive, right? I mean, uh, at home, I mean, I was always the fast first one to finish eating. My mom said, it's not a race. I said, Mom, everything's a race. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's the way I'm made. Absolutely. What, what lessons, Ruben, um, I, what, you know, and, I, and I'm using this series to speak to athletes a lot because I, I'm interested in and I want to share with our listeners, uh, the lessons that we have taken away from our sporting lives, that we, that we have applied to our lives in, in particular, but that they can uh, apply to their lives as well. What lessons do you, would you say you have taken away from sports? Well, uh, gosh, there's so many, but one of them is uh, uh, resilience, right? Because you're in, in any sport, you don't win every single time. You, you're going to lose. So you have to learn how to come back. You know, what do you do when you lose? Yeah. What do you do when you're having a bad, you know, uh, I was just watching the, uh, the, the women's final, uh, Australian Open on TV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Incredible. The girl from Japan, Osaka, she, yeah. uh, um, uh, she was winning in the first sets. She won the first set, 7-6. And then she's winning the, the, the second set, 5-3. to three. She, and, and she's 40-0, right? She's got three championship points. Then she had a total breakdown where she, she uh, lost it. 15 out of the next 20 points, and she was crying, right? And yeah. she lost the second set, and everybody thought she's done. And then somehow, you know, she put a towel over her head, and I think that was a really smart thing to do. She didn't want to look at anybody. She just wanted to get in her head. And then she came back in that third set and won, and now she's ranked number one in the world. First Japanese person to be ranked number one in the world in tennis. Yeah. And so how do you do that? And, and she's 21, but she's going to take what she learned and she's going to have that for the rest of her lives because now she knows, hey, whatever life gives me, I got what it takes inside to, you know, fight back, to get back mm -hmm. up. So that's one thing. Another thing is teamwork, right? You know, how you can't do it by yourself. Absolutely. I mean, even the booze. Uh, when, when I started, I was a... Uh, uh, I was a cocky 21 year old, you know, I thought I could do everything by myself and it didn't take too many luge runs to realize I need some help. Yes. <laughs> Chiropractors, doctors, financial, you know, yeah. everything. Yeah. It's so uh, teamwork. And then uh, another thing is, you know, you gotta, you have to learn to, to be coachable, right? Uh, to listen to your coach, to humble yourself to their experience and their leadership because mm -hmm. they go the way. And so those are things that I've taken and, and used all my life. No, I appreciate those. Are, those are, and those are great lessons. I, I think, you know, people often, uh, uh, you know, especially in the business world as an entrepreneur, as a salesperson, you, you tend to think that, man, this is all about me. I have to be a rainmaker. And you absolutely have to be, right? The, the, it's, the journey starts with you, but it doesn't end with you because mm -hmm. you need people who, who are there to support you, right? Encourage you, sometimes give you a, a swift one up the, the hair, <laughs> you know? Um, and when it doesn't go right, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. You have to be resilient. You have to find a way to, to, to always bounce back and know it, as you say, that you have what it takes inside of you to overcome whatever life throws at you. So Yeah, um, yeah. The Olympics. 
Sorry, go ahead. I'm going to do something here real quick, okay? I just, did you hear that little noise uh, uh, about yeah. a minute ago? That mm -hmm. well, I was getting a text, so I'm gonna turn this off, right? Cool, cool. But my text is a luge. It's a whoosh. it's the uh, sound of a luge, right? Yeah. And, and then if you give me a phone call, it's a ding dong, it's the sound of the start, right? Got and you. then the rings here, I mean, I got Olympics everywhere. I'm bombarding my brain with where I wanna go. You gotta keep your goals in front of you and be thinking about them all the time. Because if you don't, life happens, right? And six months go by and then you realize, oh my gosh, I forgot I was going for the Olympics. I just blew through six months, right? So I, and, you, and it's an interesting point because you are trying to compete in your fifth Olympic games, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> I get bored. I mean, Devin, you know, I have this really weird, uh, uh, Seven years go by after an Olympics, and I get really bored, and I got to do something, climb a mountain or do something. Yeah, yeah. So uh, last year, I, uh, after seven years after the Vancouver Games, I went to Calgary, and I took a few runs, mainly to see if this old body can handle six Gs still, right? Yeah. Or five Gs or whatever. Calgary's not that bad. But, um, <laughs> and I did, I'm sliding better than ever. I'm actually relaxing and listening to the coaches better than I did before. Wow. Uh, my starts are the worst now. They have me doing yoga and stretching. I mean, they said, you, you know, you, you slide better. Your start is, you're strong, but you're paddling. You paddle like a little girl, man. You need to. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. So we're trying to get an extra mile an hour before curve one. And then they said, I got a shot. <laughs> but if I make it, I'll be 59. 59, 59 years old in the Beijing Olympics, I'd be the oldest ever. I mean, how cool is that? Well, you're the, so do you, uh, are you familiar with Grandma Luge and Abanathi from the- Sure, I traveled with her for years, yeah. Oh, of course, so <laughs> you're the oldest guy, but yeah, she's competed in like, in six Olympic games, man. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I can't know. imagine. And she did them all straight. I can't yeah. imagine doing one thing yeah. for so long, you know? I get bored. I did, I did two. And then I quit, right? I quit for six or seven years. Yeah. And then I did, uh, uh, did um, uh, Salt Lake, and then I quit again for seven mm -hmm. years. And then I did Vancouver, and I quit again. And, but, man, she did six in a row. I mean, that's... Yeah, that's, that's, that's longevity. That's longevity. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. So you've, re you're, you've retired and come out of retirement three times. And, you know, when I speak to athletes uh, like us who have retired, they they talk about just how tough retirement is. Well, is, is you, you mentioned being bored, but what, what is it like for you mentally when you wake up the morning after the Olympic Games and you realize, hey, there's no need to go training anymore? It's mm. so you know what? Uh, after the Calgary Olympics, I was depressed for about three months. And it happened to me again after the Alperville. Olympics, mm -hmm. right? And when women talk about postpartum depression, you know, they just had a baby. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same thing, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, wow, I got a baby. Oh, I got to change diapers now. And so, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after Salt Lake City, it didn't happen. And you know why? Right before the Salt Lake City Olympics, this little kid said, hey, Ruben, when you come back from the Olympics, will you be my show and tell project in school? Mm -hmm. I thought, sure, why not? And I took the sled and the helmet to show to the kids. And the principal takes me to the auditorium. There's 200 kids there. He says, you got 45 minutes. Have at them. Yeah. And I thought I was going to die, right? Because I've never taken a speech class in my life. And I'm, believe it or not, I'm, I'm an introvert. Hey, I get excited when I talk about this stuff, but I'm usually yeah. a very introvert. I told my story. Afterwards, he said, man, you're better than the people we pay. You need to do this for a living. And I always wanted to have my own business, so I quit my job three days later, and I just started calling every school in Houston. And I started a business. And so it's because I had a new dream and a new goal that I was too busy to get depressed, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so what I tell people, that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because you have, when you're getting close to your dream, you better be thinking about the next dream. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. You have to I, keep I, on pushing, baby. You have to keep on pushing. That's it. Yeah, I mean, you should make a T-shirt out of that. You know, that, that would be a good slogan. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah, a book, maybe. Let, you know? let, let me write that down, yeah. Yeah, but now you got to give me royalties, okay? Because <laughs> it's such a great idea. But, 
<clears throat> but yeah, you have to have another dream. Otherwise, man, you're, you're in trouble. Yeah, you're, you're, big trouble. You, yeah, you, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you don't have a dream, if you don't have something to pull you, if you don't have something to engage you, then all that you've done in the past is feels like a letdown because there's nothing energizing you anymore to get up in the morning. You know, and yeah. I, and I, you know my first two Olympics were very different uh, for me because I was in the army in Jamaica. And so, wow. so it was like I took my bobsled uniform off, put my army uniform back on and I went to work, right? My, in my head, bobsledding was an extension of my military service. But I remember after Salt Lake City, after Nagano, waking up in Salt Lake and like, okay, so what do you do, do with your life now? You know, because I wasn't going to be doing two a days anymore. And you're right. That's kind of how or when my speaking career got started. And we're going to talk about your speaking in a minute, but talk to me about the Olympics. So you've been to four, man. Um, for me, all three of my Olympic experiences were a little bit different. Uh, what were yours like? What are some of the memories or the fondest memory you have of the Olympics? Well, you know, Calgary, and I'm sure you agree, uh, that was our first one. Your first you one and my first one. You always remember your first, right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know, you don't walk around. You just float around and, mm -hmm. and you develop cheek muscles because you're smiling nonstop for two weeks. It's like, oh, my gosh, this is so awesome. And, uh, and the people in, in Calgary are so friendly, you know, and they oh, were so they were the best. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were so excited because they wanted to get the Olympics for 20 years and they always lost to another city. So when they finally got it, you know, they went nuts. Yeah. And so uh, Calgary was awesome. I got goosebumps just telling you about it. <laughs> Albertville. Oh, my gosh. Did you, did you go to Albertville? So you're real. You're real. I was thinking about this as, we're, as I was getting ready. We were in the same village. Up in La Plania. La Plania, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. I was there. I was there. We were in the same building. They had yeah, all we the, were in the same building, but Yeah, it looked like a like a, a, a Coke can, remember? Yeah, it was a it was a club med. And, a club uh, med, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> I don't know about you, but man, after Calgary, Alberville was such a letdown, you know? Was, people were not yeah. excited. The people actually were, they didn't even want us there because uh, they were having to close their shops and they were losing business. The food was magnificent. I mean, they had these big old tables with hundreds of kinds of cheeses. It was all gourmet, but, you, what I, but I learned that gourmet food with bad customer service sucks. I'd rather have a sandwich with good customer service. You, you, you know why, why part of the reason why Alberville was a letdown I, is because I believe we were spoiled in Calgary. I did not realize that Calgary was the first time in the winter, history of the Winter Olympics when almost everybody was housed in the same village except for the skiers. They were in Bam. So there was this camaraderie. Yeah, yeah the sense of family. It's just like it was so easy to meet people from different sports. And here we were in Calgary, in, in La Plania. Who were you seeing? Bobsledders and losers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like. Yeah. Yeah, you know? I got my picture with Herschel Walker. That's, I think that's the highlight of my oh, <laughs> Alperville. Yeah, I mean, exactly. you know, it was so, so much of a letdown that my, my buddy, Pablo, Pablo uh, Garcia from Spain, he luged for Spain. He and I, we said, let's get out of here. And after our race, because luge is right after the opening ceremonies, after our race, we hey, took a train. Can, can, can a, a train. Sick of That's another reason why bobsledders hate you guys, man. We have the best schedule. Oh, <laughs> my God. You're done right at the start of the Olympic Games, two weeks of partying. That's <laughs> all. Two man is at the end of the first week. Then you train for the second week. Four man at the end of that second week. And then the closing ceremonies. And no, you no, you guys are working too hard. Days. It's just wrong, man. No, and you know what? You, know, you probably don't even know this, but we come a week before. So we get three weeks. <laughs> right? We're the first ones in the Olympic Village. By the time everybody shows up, we're yeah. friends, we're insiders with the cooks, with the maids, with everybody, right? So we another get some reason to hate, another reason to hate losers. Ah, uh, there you go. See, you <laughs> should have done a luge. Man. <laughs> but I know you like company. That's okay. Yeah, I, I like company. What, what, what can I say? So, so you, you, are, you go to Salt Lake, 
Um, I think you were you used to sell copiers, right, and shredders. Yeah, so copiers and Salt Lake. I loved it. Did you do Salt Lake? I, no, I was there. I didn't compete at, at the okay. time. I thought Salt Lake was my favorite one. That was um, my toughest Olympic Games, man. Salt Lake, because I was at the race, watching the race, watching guys I used to beat, and go, "There's mm. no I shouldn't be in this race." Oh, that was, yeah, that would hurt. Yeah. They treated us so nice in Salt Lake City. You know, they would always ask, uh, how's your Olympic experience? I must have heard that a hundred times. And finally I realized, hey, they must be training them to ask that. But it's such a good question, you know, because it's a, it's a, it's a way of saying how's everything going, but uh, kind of, uh, you know, soft, right? Not mm -hmm. like, you know, and so, uh, or can I help you? I mean, I go to a store and somebody says, can I help you? No, I don't want you to help me. <laughs> I want to look for myself. I'll ask you for help when I'm ready. But how's your experience like? Ooh. And uh, they, they just treated us sweet. so nice. I, I, I loved it. And then uh, uh, Vancouver was was good, but not, a, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it just didn't feel as, as good as Calgary. Calgary was yeah. just unreal. Yeah, Calgary, we were spoiled. It's, it's hard, I think, to, to live up to that standard that they set yeah. in Canada, for sure. You know, so, you know, we're, we're actually, we're, we're talking about dreams early, and I think, you know, the Olympic Games and, and competing as an Olympian is what really epitomizes for us athletes uh, this crowning achievement of a dream, even if you didn't win a medal. You yeah. know, I remember, you know, at the opening ceremonies, marching in the stadium, right? At, at, and what, 35, 50,000 people, more cameras than you can count. And yeah. people are screaming. And, 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 and as you have watched the Olympics, you know. Uh, and they even put sand there for you to make you feel, to feel, <laughs> make you feel good, man. I feel like you're right. But here it is that, you know, in that <laughs> moment that your image is, being broadcasted around the world because you have watched this as well and you you know that there's some little kid somewhere around the world looking at you going wow he must be one of the best athletes in the world and yeah. in that moment i feel like well wow, this is what it feels like to live a dream yeah. oh yeah yeah it was it's, it was awesome let me explain that comment because nobody's going to understand that it's, <laughs> it's very insider stuff see during the the calgary games it's a winter and it's supposed to snow, right? I mean, it's Canada in the winter and there was no snow. And it was going to look really bad on TV. So they, they brought in white sand from somewhere in the Caribbean and they covered the whole stadium in sand. It looked like a beach, but on TV it looks like snow. <laughs> so it was crazy. No, Calgary was, was crazy. You remember how warm it got. I, I, you know, yeah. I remember telling people that second week during the four mine, I was in the back of a pickup driving around in sunglasses and t-shirt, man. I'm like, wow. if this yeah. the Chinook rolled in and it got really, really warm. So yeah, but still an amazing experience. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so four Olympic games, right after Salt Lake, uh, this kid invited to go do show and tell and you, and you killed it like an Olympian, you killed it. And he <laughs> thought, oh, maybe I should try the speaking thing, right? So that's how you got started in speaking. Yeah, and it was because the the principal was in my face. I mean, he was almost like he sounded like he was mad. He was so passionate, right? He says, "Man, you got a gift. You need to do this for a living. You're better than the people we pay." It was that last part that got me interested. <laughs> and I said, "What? You get paid for show and tell?" And he said, "No, it's the speaking profession. Don't you know anything?" And right. so uh, uh, he changed my life. Well, the kid changed my life by putting me there, but the principal, you know, and and see, I tell people. When somebody compliments you, they have seen something about you that sticks out. They've, yeah. they've seen a glimpse of your greatness, right? Mm -hmm. And so you need to thank them, right? And you need to think, hmm, maybe I am really good at this. Otherwise, why would they compliment me, right? And maybe that's something that I can take to reach my dream. Yeah, absolutely. But goes back to this whole business of teamwork because as – in the broadest sense, that kid and that principal were members of your team. They saw something in you. He yeah. saw, the kid saw, you, you know, from your experience that you had something to share. And the yeah. way you shared it, the principal saw that he had a passion for sharing your story, telling stories that is going to, you know, help move and inspire people. So that's awesome. Um, so I know you have written, you know, a couple of books. You have written Courage to Succeed, which is a bestseller. 
uh, you know, translated in 10 languages. You have uh, written um, The Inner Game of Success. You have written Dreams, uh, Struggle and Victory with your daughter, Gabrielle. By the way, I have, I have my copy yeah. here. I'm not trying to put in there, whoa. Um, you know, and, and a number of other books. But all your books, Ruben, you know, speaks to the, the universal principles for success in sports and in business and in life. Um, so uh, maybe a two-part question here. One, um, what advice would you have for someone who is thinking about becoming an author and want to become a best-selling author? Um, okay. What tips would you share with them? Yeah, sure. You know, when I got started speaking, I, I just started calling schools. And it, I, this is March, right? It's right after the Olympics. March, April, May, I'm living the dream, right? I've got my own business. I'm making money. I was only, I didn't know what to charge. So I was getting 500 bucks to speak at a school, and I thought I had won the lottery, right? I was speaking everywhere. Yes. And uh, but I was so focused on the schools that I forgot that the summer was going to be dead, right? It was vacation. Mm -hmm. And so June, July, and August, nothing, right? Zero dollars. We're fifty thousand dollars in credit card debt because everybody asked me, "Who's your sponsor, Ruben? Coke, Pepsi, Nike?" No, mine are Visa and Mastercard, right? I always put it on the card yeah. Yeah, before I did, right? And so I had a big debt. And by August, top of the world at the Olympics, right in February. By August, we're on food stamps. Almost lost mm -hmm. the house. I mean, very humbled at this point. And I realized, oh, my God, I tell everybody they have to find a coach or a mentor, somebody that's already done what they need to do, and I'm not even taking my own advice. I need to find somebody that understands this business. And so I found a guy in Houston that had been a, a – he had actually been a top copier salesman, too. He was, like, number one in IBM or Xerox mm -hmm. or something. He became a speaker, so he knew sales, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, 12 years in it, and he's doing great. He's living in a great big house and driving a great car. So – you know, he's got fruit on the trees, right? He's not a theorist. You got to find somebody that's done it. Uh -huh. and, so, and so I said, man, will you be my mentor? And at first he didn't want to. He said, nah, nobody ever listens to me and it's, I'm not wasting my time. I says, man, you, whatever you say, I'll do. I'll make you look good, man. If you tell me I got to shave my head and wear lipstick, it'll make me a better speaker, man, we'll do it right now. He goes, right. okay. Fine. So we're going to meet once a, a month. You take me out for lunch, that's what he said. You got me for an hour, okay? Bring a list of questions, I'll answer anything you want, and then at the end, I'm gonna give you some homework. If we ever meet, you didn't do last month's homework, it's over, because I want action people. I said, sounds good, man, but I can't afford to buy you lunch, because uh, I'm on food stamps, okay? We're gonna go to Starbucks, you can have anything on the menu, as long as it's coffee of the day. Put as much sugar in it as you want, but that's all I'm buying. <laughs> and he laughed, he said, okay, fine. Yeah. Well, the first time we met, he says, I don't care if you're a 10-time Olympian. Unless you write a book, no one's going to take you seriously because the author is considered the authority of his subject. He wrote the book on it. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I can't write a book. I made C's in English. In fact, my parents, they celebrated when I came home with a C. <laughs> and, uh, he says, doesn't matter, man. You got a great story. You write it down. We give it to some A students. They clean it up, okay? That's just grammar. I said, right. oh, my gosh, I didn't think about that. And he goes, yeah, it's called editing. So shut up and sit down. I mean, it was like that. He was like a tough coach. But that was the courage to succeed. And it's been translated to a bunch of languages. And then I learned the process. And what I learned is that you got to break it down, okay? If you have a – everybody has a book in them. They do because everybody mm -hmm. has life experiences and everybody can teach somebody else about something. And so don't write, don't write a book. Write 20 articles. OK, mm -hmm. and, and, and so f figure out what your table of contents might be, right? What your topics of your articles might be and talk about it with some of your friends. Right. So you come up with something that you think is going to be helpful and then do a little bit of research. Right. Spend a few weeks, you know, on the Internet reading and, 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 and take files, one file for every chapter. And every time you read something that fits that 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 article, that, that article, you put it in there and mm -hmm. then you start writing them. And before long in a year, you can have a book. It's a big project, but anybody can do it. And believe it or not, people, I tell people I'm an Olympian. Wow. I tell them I'm an author. Wow. Right. They think it's harder to be an author. Exactly. It's not. Okay. It's a lot harder to be an Olympian. I think so too. I would endorse that for sure. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, no, but, but you're, you're absolutely right. I, I think it's a key to achieving any goal, right? Is to, to break it down a little bit at a time. And as I always say, you know, you don't eat an elephant with one big bite. It's like tiny, many tiny bites, right? And yeah. Here. And so if you- I'm half Italian. It's, uh, you don't eat a salami, you got to slice it, you know? <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so yeah, if you, if you take it one step at a time, and it's really great advice, uh, you know, consider each chapter really just a, a, an article. An article. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you do a blog. For one year, I'm going to do a blog. You might be able to write a chapter, but you can always write an article. That's yeah. pretty, pretty good advice. So, so that's great advice, man. Um, so secondly, you know, what is the secret to success, Ruben? You know, we know there's no linear path to success. There are always going to be obstacles in our way. There are going to be frustrations and setbacks and sometimes a steep learning curve, you know, broken bones and uh, in, in your case. And it's sometimes just damn hard, right? Uh, so, so what is it, would you say, that keeps you from throwing in the towel? What makes you unstoppable when well, you have your goals? You know, when I was a kid, my dad got me to read biographies. He said, if you'll study the lives of great people, you'll figure out what works, what doesn't work in life. And mm -hmm. over and over again, what I saw was perseverance, right? I mean, uh, all these successful people I read about, they were just a bunch of hardheads, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they wanted yeah. their dreams so much, right? They had two types of courage. They have the courage to get started and they have the courage to not quit, right? Well, the courage to get started, that from, comes from believe it's possible. If you believe something's possible, hey, I'll give it a try. If you want it badly enough, nothing will make you quit, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you stay in the game long enough to learn the skills, give yourself a chance to learn the skills that will help you reach your dream. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard, but it's possible. So, uh, and, and then, you know, you surround yourself with winners and with coaches and with people that will keep you in the game, right? People, you know, I have a dream team. I have a dream team. I'm sure you do too, right? The people that are my encouragers, uh, the people that support me. And if somebody that back then, I realized right away, you know, I, I was on the bench in my soccer team. I would take, tell the kid next to me, I'd say, hey, I'm going to be in the Olympics in four years. He almost fell off laughing, right? I, I thought, hmm. After, after experiencing that a few times, I realized there's two types of people in the world. They're either on your team or they're not, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, with the good ones and you disassociate from the other ones because they could steal your dream away. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. So you, you mentioned courage. How, how would you define courage? You know, Aristotle, he said that you, you, you become what you repeatedly do, right? Mm -hmm. So if you do something lots of times, you become like that, right? You become known for that. Mm -hmm. And so courage, it doesn't mean you're fearless, okay? I mean, that, no, it means... You're afraid, but you do it anyways, right? You fell off that horse, and what do they tell the cowboy? Get back on the horse, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just going to move to a city and drive taxi cabs for your life. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, and so uh, you have to do what you fear. You have to be willing to do that. And that's why having a coach I – mean, in fact, when I, was, when I was teaching Gabriella, my daughter, to ride a bike, right, many years ago, uh, the first time, you know, I thought, ah, piece of cake, we're going to do this in a day. Well, mm -hmm. after she was so excited, but after she fell a few times, she wasn't so excited anymore. Uh -huh. And I had realized that I have to help her, I have to encourage her, and I have to push her, tough love, to get her to keep going, right? And then the second day we came back, it's still not much better. And then I realized that whenever she got afraid, she stopped pedaling. And then there's, she lost momentum and she fell. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, from now on, we pedal, pedal, pedal. Even if you fall and you're on your side, I want to see you pedaling, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and so yeah. she started doing that. And that, now she's going 10 feet instead of five feet. Right? Right. Right. And then the third day, uh, man, she just took off. And she went out about 30 feet, but she had no control, right? So she went off kind of to the side. It was like a question mark. And then she made this circle. And she, but she still must have thought that I was holding her bike. Because when she saw me, her eyes got big. Oh, ow, she fell down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. jumped up, right? Yeah, I did it. That's right, baby. That's right. Too, so exactly. that's when I realized how important a coach is because he helps you get through the fear stage. You can't do it by yourself. But you, you said something really insightful there. You know, when you, you told her, hey, no matter what, keep pedaling. Because the thing that gets you through the fear, which we define as courage, is the action. Is the fact that you keep on, you keep pedaling, right? You keep on pushing. Good point. That's so, right. So it's, it's, 
What was yeah. it like for you? T talk to me about. Getting hot now, man. I'm, I'm getting excited telling you all these <laughs> stories. There goes the code. Okay. There you go. So, dude, I, you know, I, I, I just I remember, and I can think back right now and feel me at the start of a bobsled race and how. I won't say I'm terrified. I'm just a nervous wreck, until they say the start is clear, right? What, what, and part of that obviously is a fear for sure. And you know, you know that once the start is clear, it's time to take action. It's time. You got to thirty seconds. There's this little clock, guys. You know, you know. So, so what was it like for you? How, how, how did you get through the, those minutes, moments leading into the start? Well, with the luge, they start you like on curve ten. And, uh, and you're going 30 miles an hour. And it's crash, 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 crash. And as soon as you figure it out, coach moves you up a couple of curves. Now you're going 40 miles an hour, right? Oh, my gosh, 40 miles an hour. There's no time to think. Crash, I was say, you know what? You 40 miles an hour feel like you're flying, right? Oh, my gosh. And that ice is hard. And, man, now 50. You literally crash your way to the top in the luge, okay? And, and, and then even when you make it to the top, well, every track is different, right? So it takes mm – -hmm. And I don't know if, if you experienced this, but let's say I made a mistake. I was late into curve seven. If I don't correct, then I'm going to be later on curve eight, and I'm going to crash on curve nine, mm -hmm. right? But you have no experience, so you don't even know that you're late. And so all these crashes, it takes, it takes several years before your brain gets trained to understand it and, and, and you're actually listening to coach. Yeah. Sometimes coach, you know, it's hard. It might be a really tight curve. And it's hard to get out, right? Like in the old days, the old uh, uh, Lake Placid track, curve one from the men's, it was impossible to get out. Right? Oh, uh, yes. Long straight away and boom. And so they would tell us to drive up, right? Because then, then we would be able to have a night to get off. Yeah. Right. Well, that didn't make sense. I'm thinking, no, if I'm driving as hard as I can and I can't go up, if I drive up, I'm going to fly out, right? And so I wasn't listening to coach because I didn't trust him. Yeah. And so, so uh, yeah, it's a it's a mental struggle. Is now it, what the coaches are telling me is, yeah, you're listening to us for the first time, but you still you know you trust us, but you don't trust yourself yet. Uh, so I'll come out of Curve Eight uh, in Calgary, guys. Curve Eight. If you saw cool runnings, okay, Curve Eight leads yes. right, and then the straightaway, and then comes the Chrysler, that big yes, circle sir. curve where they crash, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Curve Eight. If you don't come out right, and then the straightaway is leans a little bit, just a little bit. And, and then there's wind that pushes you to the left. And so by the end, man, you're always – so even when I'm coming out straight out of eight, I get nervous and I put my feet down. And they say, man, you had a great line. Why'd you put your feet down? You have to trust yeah. yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's all – I think you know, that's all part of the growth. And it, it, it's really interesting because here it is that you're working on your fifth Olympic Games, but you're still learning. You're still We're learning. I'm a baby. Yeah. I'm a baby. Listen to this. You're gonna. I, I am so amazed. Coach always tells me at the end of the run, Ruben, you must relax, right? Because I am tight because I'm scared to death, right? Yeah, yeah. And you can't steer. You can't be good at any sport if you're tight. You have to be loose and relaxed. You're relaxed, yes. Right? Mm. Yeah. Well, I was. Uh, uh, I had a new helmet uh, when I was in Calgary, and and they were, and they have to. Uh, adjust the visor so it'll fit me so they have to cut it and so I'm sitting in the in in this um, workshop and one of the coaches who's a three-time Olympian from from Latvia his name is Guntis and so Guntis says okay uh, let's try it now so I'm laying down and we're seeing if the visor is okay good now now uh, sit up okay now lay down and now when I lay down I would grab the handles right like this right the handle of the, uh -huh. with my fist yeah. right that's how I always grab it. He goes, what are you doing? That's not how you grab the handle. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he yeah. goes, no, you grab it with these two fingers, like a pistol, okay? Because if you grab it like this, it makes your forearm tense, your, and you, that tenseness starts to You the shoulder to stare. Yes, you hold like this, just so you're holding, but there's, you can't make force with two fingers. I said, okay, fine. And I said, okay, lay down again. I lay down, muscle memory, still have the leg. I said, get off that sled. He took a grinder and he cut my handle so they only fit two fingers. He said, like, what are you doing to my sled? He goes, I'm making you faster. Shut up. <laughs> so four-time Olympian doesn't even know how to grab a hold of the handles. Can yeah, you pull gotcha. that? But, but that, that, that's a tough love right there. That's a, that's, that is a teammate that you need. So oh, yeah. We, we never stop learning. We never stop 
needing teammates, no matter how accomplished we think we are. So it's a you know, yeah. great lesson. If you're so green, my, you're growing, right? If you're ripe, you're gonna yeah, rot. Absolutely. <laughs> So, dude, this is this been, this has been awesome, man. It's it's really great to catch up with you, and you know, uh, you know, kind of hear your stories and 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 get to get those, uh, get you to share those those gems, those pearls of wisdom with us. So, thank you so much for uh, for appearing and keep on pushing. Um, you know, so I know you're a, a speaker, and I want you to tell us where people can find you. Let's start there. Sure. Uh, my website is thelugeman.com. The Luge Man. The Ice Man was taken. That would have been so much easier. Oh. It's thelugeman.com. There's videos there and, and all kinds of cool stuff. All right, cool. So, yes, folks. So, thelugeman.com uh, to find my friend, uh, you know, Ruben uh, Gonzalez, the, the luger, um, who, you know, has an amazing story and, and uh, some real nuggets of wisdom that's going to help you to really reach the next level in terms of your, your business and your life in general. And on that note, Ruben, I know you have a special offer for our, our listeners as well. Well, I, uh, I've always believed it's, it's all about mental toughness, right? Coach, you, coach used to always say, you're only six inches away from success. And I never understood what that meant. He goes, yeah, six inches. That's the distance between your ears, okay? It's, yeah. it's what you're thinking. <laughs> and so – I've, um, I put together a course, and, and what I see there that helps, that, that keeps people back, everybody knows what they need to do, but getting themselves to do it, that's the catch, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you have all this firepower, but no trigger finger, right? Because it's that fear of the unknown, fear of, the, of failure that holds people back. And so I created an online course. It's about 10 hours altogether between videos and audio, 70 really short message uh, um, lessons that you can go at your own speed. And it's designed to help you to grow inside, become mentally tough, perseverant, and develop the habits that you and I use to reach our goals. It's not rocket science, guys. Mm -hmm. It's just reprogramming your mind so you can do what you can do. And so uh, uh, you can check it out. You can actually uh, even check out some of the videos, uh, you know, test it out, pre-test it ahead of time. But it's Olympia, OlympiaSuccess.com. And it's 497, 497 bucks. But the cool running special, if you put cool runnings, right, as your product code, you're gonna get 300 bucks off, all right? So only 197. And it's good stuff. And it's good stuff for your kids, too. So that's, that's the offer, Olympia awesome. Success. Thank, thank you for that, man. So OlympiaSuccess.com. OlympiaSuccess.com. And then cool runnings, all one word. Put together, that's your coupon code. You know, you better spell it right because that's worth 300 bucks to you. <laughs> all right, guys. So OlympiaSuccess.com. And don't forget, it's all about cool runnings. Use that as your discount code. You'll get this amazing uh, success coach, uh, you know, in, in Ruben and, and, and his course uh, to help you become mentally tough and get to the next level. Ruben, Luge Man, it's been awesome. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, gracing us with your presence and sharing your wisdom with us. We are Evan, better for it, my man. Sled God, man. <laughs> uh, I tell you, <laughs> it's, it's great, man. I, I wish, uh, oh, man, uh, well, we'll, I hope I see you uh, soon, okay? You need to come visit me in, in Colorado one day. Yes, indeed, indeed.